Tari and the White kept the attack up to Musselbrook in a fast, entertaining match. Tari's centre forward Ian Gates was in blistering form. He jagged four goals, constantly pestering Musselbrook's keeper, Leon Smith. Gates, a state rep, may have been the difference between the teams. The final score, 5-1, not a real indication of the battle. Musselbrook never said die, but simply couldn't catch up. About 30 teams started in the Hunter division of the knockout comp. Both Taree and Musselbrook now move on to the final 30 teams in the state, with Taree seeded as Hunter 1. The Edwards family from Burrigal got the VIP treatment all the way today. They were chauffeured to the local Holden dealership to meet company executives and be presented with the keys to their new car. Judged family car of the year by the NRMA, the Commodore Acclaim was surrounded by just some of the 815,000 entries that poured in from a cutout competition run in two editions of the NRMA's members magazine, Open Road. The dream come true, we've always dreamt of owning a brand new car, but we didn't think it would happen this time in our lives, but they've certainly made it happen for us now. Karen Sheffield, the, my name and my membership number on the back of the envelope, and I said, oh, that's a waste of time, we'll never win that. And she did, put a stamp on it, sent it off, and here we are. A carpenter, Keith Edwards, is out of work at the moment, and the Commodore comes as a welcome step up from the family's 83 Falcon. It was a cold-blooded murder. A 27-year-old Craig Victor Brudelin shot his former girlfriend Tracy Gilbert through the head while she was working at a hairdressing salon in the Newcastle suburb of Woodbury. When the police arrived, they saw him leaving the salon still carrying the gun. A police officer drew his revolver, demanding his surrender. Brudelin got into this car and turned the gun on himself. Tracy Gilbert died in hospital the following day. Brudelin recovered from his head injuries but is now legally blind. A jury found Craig Brudelin guilty of murder and he was sentenced to life imprisonment. However, on appeal, that sentence was reduced to 18 years with a non-parole period of eight. That was before the truth in sentencing laws were introduced. Yesterday, just six years after the senseless killing, the Offenders Review Board agreed to let him out of jail. For Tracy's father, justice has not been done. If they murder somebody and, and they get life, or whatever it may be, they stay there and serve their sentence, not get out in these short terms. Brutalin will be released from Silverwater Jail in Sydney on Monday. It means that He's coming home, but my daughter's not co coming home. Jane Anderson, NBN News. The latest version of the Jesus Christ Superstar rock opera has taken New Zealand by storm. It, it plays to 10% of the entire population, not counting the sheep. And um, the, uh, what happened was that it is the largest grossing show ever of anything ever in the history of New Zealand. I mean, it, it's amazing. Ex Noiseworks lead singer John Stevens is playing Judas, the same role he performed during the concert version in Sydney two years ago. There's always a challenge when you're performing and uh, for me, uh, I guess because it's smaller venues, the people can actually see your face. So I guess that's where the acting sort of thing comes into it. But Judas, you know, the role of Judas is such a passionate role anyway. 23-year-old Denny Hines will play Mary. The last musical I was a chorus member, this musical I'm actually like, <laughs> I've got a billing. Uh, <laughs> my name is written in black and white. And so yeah, it's definitely a highlight of the, my career. 
An unknown Daryl Lovegrove has been cast as Jesus, with Noel Ferrier as King Herod. The $4 million spectacular opens at the Civic late August. The police crime scene unit inspected the burnt out shell today to determine the cause of the fire. Early investigations suggest material, possibly gymnasium mats, were too close to an arc light. It's believed the building shutters drew in air and fanned the blaze, creating a smoky trap for fire crews. Yesterday's fire has shocked the school community, robbing it of a basketball court, canteen and the much used stage. A significant loss for a school of the performing arts. We now have no public performance area and uh, we'll have to consider using sites outside of the school and that of course will be a tremendous cost. A temporary canteen is catering for students on the last two days of term but the school will find it harder to cover the income that will be lost from hiring out the hall to church groups. We're talking of uh, something like $10,000 for the remainder of the year. Year 10 and HSC exams will have to be transferred to another building or school. Principal Merv Cottrell says although the material cost has been high, no students were hurt. Fortunately it did happen after school and uh, it certainly would have caused all sorts of problems otherwise. The Education Department will decide the future of the building during the school holidays. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. Developer Garba Simoni briefed Cessnock Council last night and he had a captive audience. I think it's great, uh, the best thing that's ever happened to Curry, or the potential to be the best thing that's ever happened to Curry for a long time. The $27 million development would produce an aluminium byproduct called Dross at this site in Mitchell Avenue at Curry's industrial estate. If passed, it would employ 50 people immediately, another 100 when fully operational. This is good news for an area where nearly one in five people is out of work. With the potential to provide 150 jobs is something we ought to at least be giving serious consideration because jobs are, 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 are you know, something that we sadly need in this area. Cessnock Council is impressed with the initial briefing but will wait for more details before officially backing the project. But it will be the Department of Planning that ultimately decides the fate of the proposal. Developer Garba Simonian is confident the project will be approved. He predicts work will start by the end of the year. Maitland Council rejected the project earlier this month, claiming the recycling plant was an environmental danger to Rutherford. Mayor Bob G, who was a strong advocate of the project, says Cessnock's welcome highlights Maitland's mistake in turning away the development. But the project could still be built at Rutherford because the developer hasn't dropped his appeal to the Landed Environment Court. Richard O'Leary, NBN News.
An unattended phone ringing out may be enough to enrage a ratepayer trying to contact a local councillor. But it's just one of the communications problems that may be answered if the Port Stephens Council decides at its meeting tonight to adopt personal computers, answering and fax machines. It's uh, really bringing uh, council up and moving with the times and uh, later on the uh, fax and answering machine facility can be used as a printer for the computers if they decide ultimately to go that way. Cost estimates to set each councillor up with their own home based office range from $1,000 through to $6,500 plus training. The cost of the ultimate outside office package, $250,000. Computers are already extensively used throughout the council building and council offices maintain technology doesn't take the personal touch out of dealing with ratepayers. I think uh, now this will mean a more personal service because whereas perhaps councillors were a bit reluctant to go out and spend a lot of time with individual constituents, they'd now be free to do so knowing that while they were away there would be a service there for ratepayers. The future shape of retailing in Raymond Terrace is also under discussion at a commission of inquiry into shopping centre developments in the town. The high level talks are focusing on applications for multi-million dollar development proposals. Sean Arnold of Cardiff was convicted in court today of 13 malicious damage offences which occurred between December last year and May this year. He told police he wasn't part of a gang but was operating on his own. Magistrate Jeff Brown sentenced Arnold to 300 hours of community service which could include working with council employees cleaning up graffiti in the city of Lake Macquarie. Most of the offences committed by Arnold occurred in his home suburb of Cardiff. RTA and State Rail Authority property were hit so to the ANZ Bank, a credit union, a Mitre 10 store and a takeaway shop. There were also the local bowling and soccer clubs. In placing him on a good behaviour bond, Magistrate Brown told Arnold, if you are brought back before me with failing to comply with these orders, it will be a minimum 12-month jail sentence. We are not in Singapore, are we? I just wanted to remind you of that. Magistrate Brown was referring to the recent punishment of American teenager Michael Fay, who received four lashes of a cane, four months jail and a $3,000 fine for similar graffiti offences in Singapore. A rainbow was trying to break through over Newcastle Beach today below a pot of gold for Surfest organisers. Newcastle councillors voted to underwrite the event, putting up a guaranteed $150,000 to make sure it goes ahead. If sponsors come forward as expected, council won't have to put up a cent. The main event at Surfest will have a new title, named after four times world champion, the Mark Richards Newcastle City Pro has its namesake a little embarrassed. It's a bit strange, you know, in a lot of cases you've just about got to be dead to have things named after you, but um, it's, it's a wonderful honour. Mark will compete in a special expression session against previous winners of the competition. Surfest will contain seven separate events, including longboards, kneeboards and bodyboards. 600 amateur and professional surfers will take part. The funding guarantee from council assuring $80,000 prize money for the main event, meaning Surfest will be a must for all surfers on the glamorous world circuit. It's a four star rated event this year which will guarantee that the very best surfers in the world will be here competing. 
surfers aren't the only winners. The event is a huge boost for local businesses with money spent on accommodation, food and tourism. Even at the lower end of it, it's millions, and at the higher uh, level, it's uh, many millions of dollars will come to the city. Surfest runs from April 5th to 9th next year. It was Terry Dozier's 28th birthday today, but he was the one giving out the presents. Terry's one of 12 players to feature in the soft drink promotion. Well, they say it's a million in, in circulation. I figure I'd take 500,000 of them, take them back to the States and <laughs> distribute them around to my family and friends and uh, just kind of brag about it for a little bit. The release of the can is also a timely distraction from the ribbing he gets from teammates about his age. Tony Jensen always gave me a trouble. He always called me old man, just like my daughter. So uh, I told him one day he'll be 28 and be saying the same thing about himself. But his ageing knee is causing trouble for the Falcon star. He's undergoing treatment in a bid to play against Hobart this weekend. It's going to be very tough. They beat Perth um, and, and that shows that they always had this, this ability to beat good teams and we can't go in there, you know, uh, with, with a lack of preparation. We've got to be well prepared and, and hungry to win a game on the road. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. It was a crash that closed the Pacific Highway for more than 24 hours and created a toxic danger zone. Philip Clout from Kempsey was driving his semi-trailer north at O'Sullivan's Gap on October 5th, 1990. His load of chemicals and pesticides was loose and moving. According to Newcastle District Court Judge Gibson, this should have been obvious to Philip Clout. As a result of Clout's driving, the semi-trailer crossed to the wrong side of the road and lost lost its load. The pallets hit two cars, injuring four people. The semi turned on its side and slid into an oncoming petrol tanker. Firemen had to wear protective clothing and use breathing apparatus during the difficult clean-up. It's toxic and uh, the brigade are taking all precautions to ensure that none of their uh, members are contaminated or uh, anyone else in the vicinity. Ten-year-old Barry James O'Shaughnessy was taken by chopper to Royal Newcastle Hospital but died later. Earlier this month, a jury found Philip Clout guilty of culpable driving causing the death of one person and injuring three others. Judge Gibson took into account Clout's previous good driving record. Mr Clout was sentenced to three years periodic detention. He'll also lose his licence for 18 months. He will serve his sentence at Grafton Detention Centre. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Sarge signed for another year of football today, agreeing to a 12-month contract with the Knights with an option to renew at the end of 1995. The veteran of more than 100 games for the club will be 31 by the end of next year and is happy he's only obligated for one season. He was offered attractive contracts from Australian and English clubs, but his desire to play for his home team and personal commitments overcame the temptation to move. My wife is expecting a baby at the, uh, at the end of this season, which would have made any sort of move um, fairly difficult. And uh, the captaincy is also um, a, a factor in, uh, in that decision. As a leader, I think it's, uh, he has enormous respect. Uh, he's, he's a terrific example both on and off the field for the people that uh, are rugby league people in Newcastle and people that are just Novocastrian. It'll be the Sarge's seventh year with the Knights, one he predicts will be the club's best with rising young stars set to blossom. But for the moment, he's only looking forward to the Knights' important clash with Penrith this weekend. Richard O'Leary, NBN News.
Last November, Ian Cleary, the then police superintendent of Newcastle, went to the South Stain floating restaurant. His daughter, who worked there, had been allegedly harassed. Udo Fries was arrested, but the charge was later dropped. In the months that followed, Superintendent Cleary was investigated and moved to Gosford. His career as a police officer apparently destroyed. Mr Cleary is adamant he was set up by brothel owners whose premises he'd tried to close under the Disorderly Houses Act. In October 1993, there was a meeting of brothel owners in Newcastle and other people were present at that meeting also. The agenda of the meeting was to get rid of Cleary because of his actions on brothels. One month later, the South Stain affair occurred. Mr Cleary says he feels so strongly about what occurred last year that he'd do it all again. People may say that I'm a masochist and I enjoy pain as a result of that. In actual fact, I have to live with myself. With what happened to my daughter that night, I could not walk away. And I don't think any real red-blooded Australian would walk away. While Mr Cleary is now free of the police service, he believes his life has been irretrievably affected. I think the credibility of uh, Ian Cleary has been damaged probably uh, and it can't be repaired. All I can hope is I can put a band-aid on it uh, and try and show people that I'm still the old Ian Cleary. The police service maintains an inquiry is underway into the South Stain incident. Mr Cleary though says he wouldn't have been allowed to retire if that was the case. Jody McKay, NBN News. The policy was first introduced about 12 months ago in an effort to share the burden of commuting. However, police believe it only added to the problem. There were a significant number of police obviously suffering a burden of travel, but uh, by virtue of this uh, uh, transfer system, there's another significant number of police now suffering the same burden. The issue has continued to flare all year, with a number of heated meetings in a bid to stamp out the program. After much heartache, the Police Association believes it's had a victory of sorts. No more forced transfers? Well, not at this stage, and uh, we're quite confident there won't be any, but uh, bearing in mind the Commissioner still has that right at any time to transfer police, but uh, we're very confident that that won't take place. While it comes as a relief to those facing the prospect of a forced transfer, it is little comfort to the officers and their families who were first off the rank. It's devastating for families whose, uh, sp whose partners are currently travelling. Um, they're travelling around 320 kilometres each shift. Uh, the families go for two or three weeks without seeing their father or, or husband. So while the decision to scrap the current transfer program has been welcomed, there are concerns a new one could be adopted in the future. Amanda Bolger, NBN News. Wet conditions didn't affect the intensity of the challenge. Newcastle in the floral skirt started confidently, leading 11-5 in the first quarter and 19-12 at half time. Wing attack, Donna Broadbent and goalkeeper Danielle Harvey figured strongly for Newcastle, Harvey turning defence into attack on several occasions. Strong defence by Randwick in the third quarter saw them shut the locals out and score some points of their own. But this surgence proved momentary. Newcastle recouped and wrapped up the game 40-23.
With the signing of this contract this afternoon, Lake Macquarie Mayor John Kilpatrick gave the go-ahead for work to begin on Charlestown's new multi-purpose centre. The facility in James Street will be built by FH Compton and Sons at a cost of $615,000. It will include a neighbourhood centre and community care rooms. There are also plans to construct a youth centre. The council's planning does provide also for a youth centre in the Charlestown area and uh, we have been seeking sites in the area. Uh, we would like to keep the resources, the community buildings all together. The Charlestown development is one of three in the city. Plans are being finalised for a similar facility at Toronto and tonight councillors will be asked to approve a $23 million shopping centre at Glendale. The Stockland Group has proposed the development on this land off Lake Road. It will include a discount department store, two supermarkets as well as numerous specialty shops. There were concerns that businesses in Cardiff might suffer, however the Mayor believes that won't occur. There'll be um, a number of mini major stores that aren't necessarily uh, already in Newcastle or Lake Macquarie and so hopefully that'll mean people can, can we'll keep the dollars locally and people will shop locally without necessarily affecting some of the neighbouring centres. Jason Gunn was born at the John Hunter Hospital last June. Twenty hours later, he and his mother Julie went home. Contrary to hospital guidelines, Julie Gunn was told of the hospital's early release program after the birth of her son. Jason died at home when he was six days old. The probable cause of death was a seizure disorder. Julie told the coroner today that if she'd been given more information, she would not have decided to take part in the early release program. Julie Gunn had been in a car crash when she was nine weeks pregnant. She smoked 10 to 15 cigarettes a day while pregnant and Jason was small when born. Jason Gunn had been temporarily readmitted to the hospital after his parents saw him have what they describe as a fit when he was only a few days old. Mrs Gunn had requested tests, including an EEG and an ultrasound, to be done on her son. She told Coroner Cole Elliott cost should never be a consideration in determining whether to order tests which would assist in diagnosis. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Invalid pensioner Tony Davies was watching television yesterday afternoon eating some sweets he'd bought from Coles at Toronto. He says he discovered the head of a mouse in the ice cream container. And I was sitting there watching a the car race and I reached down and lifted up and I lifted up half a mouse's head. Tony Davies had bought two packets of lollies. He opened them and poured them into the container. He says he doesn't know which one contained the mouse's head and he denies that it could have been in the ice cream container before he put the sweets in it. Uh, I said I'm glad I got it and not some little kid because um, somewhere else is the rest of that mouse and some other lollies. Mr Davies contacted Coles immediately. Today he gave them the packets and the unwelcomed extra. The stock already has been taken off show throughout the whole Coles store. Coles manager Ty Rinses says all packets of the sweets have been recalled. 